Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Behavior on a Budget, presented by the Kentucky Humane Society. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Meg Meredith, Operations Manager here at the Foundation, and I'll also be your host for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate as an attendee today. This is what you should see on your screen. So the left hand of the screen should be what the presenter is presenting. And the right hand of the screen, if you click on this arrow right here, um, then you can minimize and maximize. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. You will also have the opportunity to submit chat questions to today's presenter, Kat Rooks, by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Deb Baer, our Executive Director, to tell you more about the Pedigree Foundation and today's webinar. Deb? Thank you, Meg. Hello, everyone. The Pedigree Foundation has been supporting shelters and rescue since 2008. Through our grant programs, we've contributed more than $6.1 million through 4,700 grants. And as a grant-making organization, we often partner with our grant recipients on education and sharing of best practices. We're pleased today to provide you all of you with this amazing opportunity to learn more about how Kentucky Humane is working with other shelters to provide behavior training to get more dogs adopted. Kat Rooks, Behavior Manager at Kentucky Humane Society, will be teaching you how you can implement cost-effective behavior strategies at your shelter. Now I'd like to introduce Kat Rooks. Kat? All right, thanks everyone. <clears throat> so I have to say I'm really excited to be able to give this webinar today. This is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, the Kentucky Humane Society is located in Louisville, Kentucky, and we are the state's largest and oldest nonprofit no-kill animal welfare uh, facility. And at this point in time, we're a very resource-rich shelter. We actually have a dedicated off-site behavior treatment facility, but that was absolutely not always the case. I've been at KHS for about 10 years now, and when I first came on, I was the behavior department, and my budget was exactly zero dollars. And so I had to figure out how to take a large, at that time, open admission shelter that was full of dogs with a wide range of issues and find ways to meet their behavioral needs and make them adoptable with a handful of volunteers and literally trash. My enrichment program was literally made from my recycling bin and the recycling bins of my friends. So we're going to go through all of that today. And I hope be able to help you guys make a big difference uh, with the animals that are in your care. So we're going to break this into two parts. We're going to start off talking about exercise and enrichment. And then we're going to move into some um, discussion of easy uh, behavior training and behavior modification solutions that you can start to implement. And you know, I want to talk just a little bit about why we should focus on behavior as a whole, uh, because it is something that I think sometimes gets sort of pushed to the side in um, favor of you know, doing lots of adoptions or providing appropriate medical care. So when we see improvements in behavior, we do see an overall uh, decrease in length of stay. That is because when folks walk through our kennels to look for an adoptable pet, dogs that are showing friendly, social, appropriate, calm behavior are dogs that they want to take into their home. And when the kennel is quiet, people will spend more time meeting that pet that they would like to eventually take home. We reduce the risk of injury both to other dogs and to staff by putting a focus on behavior. We see an increase in emotional health. We see better placements in homes, and then this helps us to meet the five freedoms that we should really all be focusing on in pro um, on providing to the animals in our care. And really what we're going to be looking at quite a bit now in, in terms of the five freedoms are the last two, freedom to express normal behavior and freedom from fear and distress. 
So envir environmental enrichment is a big key component to a successful behavior treatment program in the shelter. And there are some very, very, very simple things that we can do to make a big change. So if you look at this picture up here, most of us have seen kennels like this. We set them up like this for a reason. And this came into um, popularity and common use with an eye to making limited staff hours go the longest way and provide a focus on disease control. So we've got these relatively sterile environments. They're easy to clean and hose out. They're, they are free from items that could be destroyed that might end up being caught in drains or ingested by the dogs. They give a very clear view of the animals inside and they provide the basics, you know, shelter from heat, rain, cold, access to food, access to water, and that's about it. These kennels, while they are, they make our lives easier in terms of cleaning um, and they can be very helpful in terms of disease control, they do have a negative impact on behavior for a couple of different reasons. <clears throat> so when we have dogs who are constantly seeing people and dogs walk back and forth in front of their kennels without giving them an outlet for normal social interaction, that creates something that's called barrier frustration, which then contributes to barrier reactivity. We have all had these dogs in our care that when you walk up to the kennel, they're barking, they're growling, they're lunging, they look terrifying inside the kennel, we get them out and they're sweet as can be. That's a great example of uh, barrier frustration in the works. That reactivity is not necessarily something that would pre present in any other environment, it is just in that kennel. When we have little to no option for mental stimulus, we start to see behaviors like pacing, circling, jumping, poop painting, <laughs> destruction of anything and everything in sight um, because dogs are incredibly intelligent. They need ways to use their brains. If we don't give them ways to use their brains, they will come up with them and we will probably not like the things that they have come up with. On all those hard surfaces, we see noise be amplified to a point where it becomes extremely stressful for the dogs who have amazing hearing and quite frankly, pretty st stressful for our staff and our volunteers and our adopters. And then because we've got that constant visual access, we are not giving our dogs a way to take a break and de-stress and decompress and recover from stress. So our shy dogs are feeling as though they are always on display. They have no way to retreat from things that are scary. That causes stress levels to rise and that causes behavior to continue to um, to compensate over the time that they're with us. Reactive dogs become increasingly frustrated because of that visual stimulus uh, issue that we talked about. So that reactivity just builds and builds and builds and builds, and we ultimately kind of hit that tipping point where we uh, come to the point of having a dog who just looks like Cujo inside of his kennel. So there are some very, very, very simple things that we can do using things that may already be within your shelter or things that we might be able to easily accumulate through doing outreach on social media pages, doing requests for donations from our community, or even reaching out to really great organizations who provide significant dis discounts on supplies to um, animal welfare agencies. So one of the first things that I encourage you guys to start thinking about doing is the kennel within a kennel trick. And I know that it kind of looks weird. You know, we walk, we've got, especially if we have um, the uh, tall standing runs for our dogs, we don't necessarily want to take up some of that floor space by putting another crate inside of it. But if we have a fearful dog or at times even a reactive dog, Setting this up as their own private space to go to can be extraordinarily helpful. When I set this up, I prefer to use an airline kennel instead of a wire crate. It is more enclosed and it gives a little bit of an increased feeling of safety. However, if you don't have an airline kennel on hand and you do have a wire crate, you can simply drape a blanket over top of it to create that same effect. When I put the kennel inside the crate, I set it up so that the door of the uh, the door of the crate is facing away from the door of the kennel. So I want the dog to be able to go around to the 
back side of the kennel to access his crate. And when he is in there, he will have privacy. If you can look at this little dog in the photo here, you can see how he is able to lie down and he is not viewable from the front. When we do this, we set this up right off the bat as the dog's safe place to retreat to all the time. And we want to set it up so that it's a very comfortable space for him. So we want to put a nice uh, soft bed or blanket inside. We want to start providing his food initially inside of the crate. And once he's regularly eating his food inside of the crate, we can then start slowly moving it out so that his feeding station eventually is separate from the crate itself. When we do this, um, especially when we implement this even at KHS, we sometimes get questions of, well, how is anyone going to adopt this dog if they can't see him because he's hiding inside the crate? And what's really cool about it is as we provide an option to escape and we allow the dog to make use of that option, he becomes far more willing to begin to explore the world outside of the crate because he knows he has a place to escape to that will be honored in the future. Whereas if he is in full display the entire time, they oftentimes just spend the entirety of their time huddled all the way at the back of the kennel, oriented away from the front of it, completely shut down and non-interactive. Providing that escape option will actually cause our dogs to be more interactive in the future. If we have dogs who are very reactive and who are not necessarily showing that fearful hiding behavior, we can look at other ways outside of putting a crate inside of the kennel to provide a break from visual stimulus. Quite frankly, we have had some very um, athletic dogs at KHS who, when we put a crate inside of the kennel, then said, oh, this is awesome. You have now provided a springboard for me to leap all the way to the top of the kennel um, and leap off the top of the crate. So for those dogs, we ended up having to take the crate out uh, just for uh, safety concerns. And instead, we went to creating a visual barricade over the front of the crate uh, by hanging something that covered part of the crate. Where you hang your item is going to vary based on the behavior that the dog you are working with is exhibiting. If you have a dog who is fearful, like the dog in that last slide that we looked at, hang a visual barrier so it covers the top half of the door and leaves the bottom half open. What this will do is naturally impact the behavior of people who are walking to the front of that kennel. Instead of standing in front of it and looming and staring at the dog, they will have to crouch down in order to see the dog inside. When we crouch down, that makes our body language far more inviting and engaging and causes dogs to be much more willing to move towards us. If instead we have a dog who is showing reactivity towards other dogs, we put that visual barricade up so that it covers the bottom half of the kennel. And that reduces some of the visual stimulus between the other dogs and can help to reduce that reactivity as we are walking dogs through our kennel environment. There are a lot of different ways that you can set up visual barricades. In the slide I have here, we went very, very simple and simply hung a blanket over the front of the kennel. If you have an engaged volunteer community, especially if you have a volunteer community of folks who really want to give back but maybe aren't physically equipped to walk some of our larger, more excitable dogs um, and who have sewing skills, you can have them, you can take measurements of your kennel, so half the height and the width of the kennel, and have them cut tarp and sew it to size and put grommets in it. This gives you a very easy barricade that you can just, visual barrier that you can just snap to the front of the kennel. And because it's tarp, it becomes extremely easy to clean using the same um, sanit sanitation processes that we would use for any other space in our shelter. If you use blankets and towels, obviously those will need to be laundered a little bit more regularly, but those are really great in a pinch, and we do that all the time at KHS. We then want to start thinking about something that we do for our dogs every day, two times a day, that can either just be a five minute enjoyable experience or can be an up to 45 minute experience that burns some mental energy and creates some engagement in the kennel. And that is thinking about feeding 
by getting rid of bowls. At our behavior retreat, all of our high energy, high drive, um, intense dogs are fed out of enrichment feeders 100% of the time. They never, ever, ever get a bowl. We do this in order to take that meal time and turn it into a prolonged session that requires problem solving in order to get food. This helps greatly to reduce boredom and it helps greatly to actually carry over into a calmer display, display of behavior throughout the duration of the day. You can also think about providing enrichment feeders during times where we know that our kennel as a whole is very prone to reactivity. So for example, if your facility is like ours, oftentimes right when we first open up for the day, we've got a line of people waiting to come in and see the dogs. It's a very exciting time of the day. That's when we might see a lot of jumping and barking behavior. Immediately before we open the door, we can think about going and distributing enrichment feeders to all of the dogs. This also does have a great impact on adopters because let's face it, dogs are really adorable when they are playing with toys and playing with feeders. So it's a really great way for them to kind of pause and really appreciate the cuteness and the individuality of each dog as he's interacting with these. There are so many different types of enrichment feeders. That last slide showed Kong wobblers. I love Kong wobblers. They are wonderful. They um, can be taken apart and put through standard dishwashers, which is really great. They stand up to intense chewers. Those are all great things about them. If you are going to try to buy Kong Wobblers for every dog that you have in your care, you're going to spend a lot of money. Um, Kong Wobblers are pretty expensive. We've added them to our Amazon wish list, and that means that we get a lot of donations of them, which is really great. But something that you can do really, really easily and on the cheap is make a PVC pipe feeder for your dogs. So basically, you just take a section of PVC pipe, and I cut them in a variety of sizes uh, so that I've got a variety of sizes for different sized dogs. And you drill holes in them that are just slightly bigger than the size of the kibble that you feed. And then you take end caps and twist those onto the top. You now have an inexpensive, durable toy that uh, can distribute kibble to your dogs and can, again, easily be thrown in the wash in order to um, uh, make sanitation very easy and not, not add a big load to your staff who are doing dishes every single day. I'm going to be sending out a resource list after uh, this webinar is over. And in that, we're going to have uh, PPC pipe tutorial links in it. But quite frankly, if you want to get started on this right now, just Google DIY PVC pipe feeder and you will find so many different pictures and ways to work through it and create it. We use muffin tins a lot at KHS. This is another thing that our community has been really great about uh, donating to us. And when we run out of ones who come through donations, I go to dollar stores and thrift stores and stock up on them. So muffin tins can create a wide variety of enrichment feeders. You can take it and set it so that uh, it, it's set up just like normal use, like you would pour muffin batter into it. Put kibble and treats and smears of peanut butter in the cups and then cover all of those with tennis balls, similar to what's going on in this slide here. That's a really easy way to create a very simple puzzle that's fun for dogs to work through. Or you can flip the muffin tin upside down and you can pour the kibble in around the cups. That is a way to create a DIY slow bowl feeder. Slow bowls are awesome. We love when they get donated, but we can't necessarily afford to buy them right off the bat, but we can use these muffin tins very, very easily. We also use them to create uh, frozen enrichment chews for our dogs. So we mix together wet and dry kibble. Sometimes we'll throw some peanut butter in there, some yogurt or something else. Uh, for some extra taste. We fill the muffin uh, tin cups up with that and freeze it. And then we can distribute it individually to dogs, uh, which is great on a hot day. Or if we have a very large dog, uh, we'll make sort of one quarter sized cups and just give the entire pan for him to work through. I mentioned before that our enrichment program at KHS run, ran off of my recycling bin, and it is 100% true. Uh, there are so many things that you guys probably have inside your home, that your volunteers have in your home, that you are either 
throwing away or recycling right now that can become wonderful enrichment feeders. Something that we do very, very, very often at KHS is we take just paper lunch bags. And we mix together some wet and some dry food, uh, put it inside the bag, roll it up, and freeze it. This gives our dog a way to express species normal behavior of destruction and dissection. So when we give our dog squeaky toys and the first thing that they do is rip them open and pull all of the stuffing out, it's extremely normal dog behavior. And that is behavior that they don't necessarily get the opportunity to express very often in the shelter environment because it can be a little bit hazardous for them there or it destroys our potentially limited supply of soft squeaky toys. These paper bags, um, our vet, our medical team is fully on board with giving these to our dogs even if they may ingest a small amount of paper. And it gives them that same tear and destroy option. You can also look at using cardboard egg crates, milk cartons. If you are using peanut butter to stuff enrichment items or to um, give pills, when the peanut butter is done, drill a hole in the bottom of the jar and give your dog the peanut butter jar to lick the end of it, uh, lick the last little remnants out of. You can take yogurt cups and put some treats in those and poke some holes in the top so your dog can bat those around in order to get treats out. We collect toilet paper rolls and paper towel rolls. Mix together wet and dry kibble, stuff that in those and freeze them. Anything that we can think of that is going to be safe to destroy, we will give to our dogs in order to let them express that behavior. At KHS, we do spend a lot of time trying to figure out each dog's individual enrichment preferences. For example, right now, we have a big old hound Roddy mix named Poncho, and he is handsome and intelligent and just about the biggest, rudest dork you'll ever meet in your entire life. What we have learned with Pancho is that he needs to eat everything through enrichment items, but he needs variety. So some days he'll just get a wobbler. Some days we'll take his wobbler and we'll put it inside of a paper bag. Some days we'll put that paper bag inside of a cardboard box for him. Some days we'll smear peanut butter on the walls of his kennel and stick his kibble to it. We switch it up, and since we have started paying close attention to his individual enrichment preferences, we have seen this dog absolutely excel in training because we are making use of this part of the day and having him use his brain in order to get his calories. It's been wonderful. If you have the option, fill up a deep freezer. This is such a great way to just make efficient use of your time. You can schedule volunteers to come in a couple of days a week and just make enrichment all day long and fill up that freezer for you. This takes a lot of the pressure off of staff, so staff isn't spending their time making enrichment all day every day. All they have to do is go to the freezer and pull out what's needed for the dogs on that uh, day. So it makes a huge difference for you. So once we have started changing the way the dog's kennels look, we've started feeding through uh, brain-challenging games as opposed to just giving our dogs kibble in a bowl, we now need to think about ways to provide adequate exercise. And I bet all of you guys probably have a really wonderful team of dog walkers that come out to your shelter and provide walks to our dogs. And that is fantastic. That is something that we absolutely want to provide for them. But if we're looking specifically at our population of very bouncy, excited, easily overstimulated dogs, I think we need to recognize that a walk is probably not sufficient exercise for those dogs. I know that for my dogs, that's not nearly enough. They need quite a bit more than that. So we want to think about ways that we can really effectively and efficiently provide uh, lots of intense exercise for them. And one of the best ways to do that is by starting to establish a playgroup program at your organization. So playgroups mean that we pair at least two dogs together in a group and allow them to play with one another. We all know nothing wears dogs out quite like play with another dog. Getting into the nuts and bolts of Building a playgroup uh, program at your shelter is 
probably a webinar in and of itself. In fact, I actually have a presentation, so maybe we can do one of those in the future. Uh, but some really simple things to start thinking about to help you get started with it. Start off with even numbers of dogs. So when dogs play, they frequently break off into pairs. So if we have a play group of two or four or six dogs, that's likely to be a little bit more successful than a group of three or five. Especially if we have the group of three, we're probably going to have two dogs playing really appropriately with one another and one dog playing referee and sort of sticking his nose in and, and frustrating the other dogs in the group. So I want to start thinking about that even numbered group. I also like to think about pairing dogs based on similarities in play styles and drives. So sometimes we'll run into dogs where we introduce them to one dog and maybe they are reactive to that dog. Maybe they are really pushy and too much for that dog. That doesn't mean necessarily that this is a dog who cannot have friends. It just means that the dog that we first chose to introduce him to was not a great friend. Kind of think about play groups kind of like dating. You know, you sort of go through quite a few misses before you find the right one. And it's perfectly okay to say that one dog that can't play with every single dog out there. When we start doing our introductions, we will take two dogs, put them on leash, have one person handling each leash, and start off just going for a parallel walk next to one each other, so, next to one another. So the dogs are walking side by side, but not yet interacting. And we start watching to see them show overt solicitations of play, like that classic play bow, or the head toss and the paw lift, or sort of doing the circle around. When we see that from both dogs, that's when we start moving in and doing an introduction, and then allowing them some very supervised time on play, definitely dragging leashes so we can separate them if we need to. Once we start to build pairs of dogs who can play well with one another, we start tracking those on a whiteboard so that anyone who comes in the next day can see that Dolly and Sammy play beautifully and they love to run and chase one another and jump in the pool and Dolly doesn't mind that Sammy is a mounter. Or if we had an intro, introduction that didn't go well, we track that so we're starting to learn about each individual dog's play style to make it a little bit easier going forwards to find the right match. Something outside of burning energy that can happen with playgroups is we can also think about this as a very, very important behavior modification tool for shy, fearful dogs. Very often when we encounter dogs who are generally fearful of people, very often we get lucky and they have good dog social skills. And that means that we can pair them with a helper dog to help them build confidence around new people. So if you've got shy fearfuls, it's a good idea to pick a social dog. When I say social, I mean social with people, a dog that actively solicits interaction and engagement from people who has an appropriate play style and start to pair that dog with your shy fearful dog. Dogs uh, learn through something called social facilitation. So for a shy fearful of dog, observes our social and friendly dog approaching and interacting with people, he's far more likely to begin to attempt that himself in the future. There are also, outside of playgroups, quite a lot that we can do in terms of games with dogs. And if we've got um, either volunteers or staff members who have a few minutes to spend doing individual training and playtime with dogs, we can think about ways to kind of maximize that playtime um, in order to both burn a lot of energy and uh, actually teach some basic obedience. So one thing that I love, 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 love to work on is a yo-yo recall with dogs. So I start off calling them to me. As soon as they get to me, I'm going to ask them to go into a sit behavior. As soon as they sit, I'm either going to take a treat or a handful of their kibble and I'm going to fling it across the room so that it scatters off away from them. Once the dog is finished consuming that reward, I'm going to call him back and have him sit again and repeat by flinging that food across the room. 
So in this, I'm working on coming back when called. I'm working on greeting me appropriately once you come back by sitting as opposed to tackling me. And I am taking advantage of our dog's natural instinct to forage for food by flinging that treat across the room and causing him to need to sniff and wander around and use his nose in order to find a reinforcer. I also love to play hide and seek games from dogs. This is something that you can do in rooms or in play yards. And you can either hide and seek yourself or you can start hiding toys from him. If you are going to start uh, hiding toys, make sure when you first introduce it, you make it really easy to find. The toy needs to hide um, in a very obvious fashion at first, but the more you engage your dog in this game, the more he can start really hunting and searching in order to find that toy. So for example, I might take a dog who absolutely loves squeaky toys like nothing else, I'll have one person hold his collar, and I'll take the toy, squeak it, show it to him, jazz him up, and I'll take it, and I'll just set it behind a crate with the end of the toy stick sticking out. Then I release the dog and tell him to go find it, and then once he does, you know, we make a big deal out of the fact that he is the smartest, best, most amazing dog that's ever lived. No one's ever found anything quite like him before. And then we gradually make it harder and harder and harder and place that toy in more challenging areas. So we're playing, we're playing with toys, but we're using our brain in order to find them, and that's going to help uh, burn quite a bit of energy. And then the last thing, something that we use daily at KHS are flirt poles. So a flirt pole is basically a dog version of the dangler cat toys. So you can buy them. There are many places online that sell them, um, and they're wonderful and durable. I make them because, again, limited budget. So we go back to our good friend PVC pipe again. And this time we take a section of it that's about three feet long. We take a piece of rope, and we take a toy. Run the rope through the PVC pipe and tie a big knot at the end so it can't pull all the way through. And then what I frequently just do on this is I take strips of fleece, oftentimes fleece blankets that have been too chewed up to be continued, to continue to use them in the shelter, and I just braid that into the rope with little tails sticking off to give something really fun to chase after. Then what I do is I take this flirt pole and I ask the dog to sit. As soon as he does, I'm going to Drape it on the ground so the toy drags on the ground and I'm going to start moving it around and playing keep away with him. I want to let him catch the toy from time to time because I don't want to build up the frustration that occurs with never, ever, ever being able to catch the toy. But once he's caught it, I then have the opportunity to practice treating with a piece of treat so that he learns to drop the toy and asking him to sit again so he's learning to show self-control in an exciting setting. Flirt poles are a great, great, great way to start to exercise high energy, high drive, high intensity dogs. They are also really great as tools for exercising dogs who need to work on mouthy behavior during play. Like those dogs who have a very rough mouth when they are attempting to grab a toy from you, or dogs who are getting a little bit overly excited and starting to jump and grab at the leash and work their way up at the leash. This is a great thing to do before we go on a walk to burn some of that energy and give an outlet for that behavior so that we don't see as much frustration come out in walks and in sort of hand-to-hand -hand toy play time. The general idea that I like to follow when I'm working with high energy, high drive dogs is I like to set up so that they can have 15 to 20 minutes of intense exercise every single day, followed by, if possible, 5 to 10 minutes of fast repetition training, followed by eating their food from an enrichment feeder. Now, shelter, shelter life, it is not often best case scenario. There are many, many, many days where we are not going to be able to provide 15 to 20 minutes of intense exercise for every single dog. I think it's so important that we 
as animal welfare employees and as advocates for these dogs, don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. You know, maybe it's the case where we prioritize five dogs to get this high intensity exercise and we work on getting them into play groups so we're exercising multiples at once each day. Um, maybe we look at the days where we have the most staff and the volunteers as being the days where we provide enrichment feeders um, so that we've got extra hands on deck to pass them out and to clean up afterwards. And the other days we say, all right, it's acceptable to feed from a bowl on this day. But if we start to take baby steps to implement this, as we start to see the improvement in behavior, that moment when you walk through your large dog holding area and see every single dog calmly and quietly laying down in his kennel as opposed to jumping and barking, that's the type of thing that's going to help staff and volunteers become invested and buy in and want to keep doing this. It truly is an incredible thing to see. So we're going to move away from exercise and enrichment and we're going to talk a little bit about training and behavior modification. And this could be this could be like a four week webinar easily to get through the things that I consider to be super, super, super important basics. But we don't have that much time because we're all crazy busy people. So we're going to hit on a couple of key points in here. I want to spend some time talking about barrier reactivity, uh, things that we can do to reduce barrier reactivity within the shelter, as well as ways that we can train dogs within their own kennels. And then I want to spend some time talking about my personal favorite population, which is the shy, fearful dogs, and some things that we can do to start making life better in shelter for them. So we talked a bit about barrier reactivity earlier. Uh, I think it's very important to recognize that it's not always reflective of how social they are with people or dogs. It is a very, very, very species normal behavior that develops because of frustration from a lack of ability to engage with the things that are passing by their environment every single day. It is an expression of overstimulation, of boredom. Um, so these things are all contributing factors for it. We at times see barrier reactivity develop because our dogs are showing some demand-related behaviors. So that might be um, dogs who are very, very, very excited about the potential for a walk and are jumping and barking when somebody walks up to the front of the kennel because that person's presence has indicated that they're likely to go uh, for a walk in the past. Or it could be dogs who are feeling fearful or anxious in the presence of the people or dogs that are approaching their kennel. And the reactivity in those cases is an attempt to get those people to go away. Making an effort to understand each dog's motivation for reactivity is very important because that's going to help you determine how you're going to most effectively address that reactivity. Um, and that's where we start thinking about operating conditioning versus classical conditioning um, in order to come up with our solution. So when we are seeing dogs who are reactive at the front of the kennel, because they are feeling fearful, anxious, stressed out. And to be uh, very clear, even those dogs who are jumping and slamming at the front of the kennel, that behavior can come as a result of fear. Even if they're a big, tough, intimidating looking dog, it can come from a place of fear. These are dogs that we need to work on solutions using something that's called classical conditioning. And what we need to do is start thinking about changing the dog's conditioned emotional response to that particular interaction. So a conditioned emotional response is how the dog, it's basically the behavioral indicators of the dog's emotional response to a situation. So how the dog feels in a particular situation is going to dictate how he responds. Really good example of common condition emotional responses that we've probably seen at home with all of our dogs. It's the difference in your dog's behavior when you pick up the leash versus when you pick up the nail trimmers. 
we pick up the leash, our dogs get excited, they start jumping, they might start barking, they might start spinning, because that leash indicates a walk is imminent, and the sight of that leash triggers happiness and anticipation from our dogs. When we pick up the nail trimmers, you know, oftentimes we see ears go down and back, tail go down, we might see the dog run and hide, some of us might see our dog growl or tooth display at us when we pick up the nail trimmers. That is also a conditioned emotional response. That is the dog showing that he is feeling fearful in response to that visual trigger. So what we want to do for our dogs who are showing reactivity, because they are fe feeling fearful or stressed or anxious in the kennels, so we want to change their response from the nail trimmer response to the leash response by pairing our presence with things that the dog inherently finds valuable. For this, you are going to need some really, really, really yummy treats. Um, I love to use hot dogs. I buy the cheapest hot dogs that I can possibly find for this and cut them into teeny tiny bits, but we wanna find something that the dogs will eat even when they are in a state of stress. And this is quite possibly the easiest training exercise that you will ever do in your entire life. You're going to take a handful of your yummy treats, and you're going to walk up to the dog's kennel, and no matter what he does, even if he barks, even if he growls, you're going to throw a piece of hot dog into the kennel and then just walk away from him. And that's it. And later on, you can come back and do the same thing over and over and over again. So when you first start this, <clears throat> you are seeing the presence of a conditioned emotional response from the dog because he's barking and growling when you walk up. As you continue to pair your presence, one, with a high value treat, and two, with the fact that you left and went away and didn't extend this interaction into something that made the dog uncomfortable, you will start to see a change in the dog's behavioral indicators when you walk up to the kennel. And what we're really looking for is what this little guy in the slide is showing us so well, what's called an anticipatory response. We want to start seeing the ears go up and forwards, the eyes brighten up, the lower jaw hang open, and that happy expression start to show up on the dog's face. This is our indication that we are starting to change how the dog feels when we approach him. And when he feels differently, he behaves di differently. In a perfect world, we would get as many people as we could to hand treats out to these dogs every time we go past the kennel. It can definitely take some education and some coaching at first because it feels really wrong when you first start this to give a treat to a dog if he's growling at you. Believe me, I know it feels very, very, very strange but it pays off immensely as we start to change the way he feels. Some stuff that we do to make life easier at uh, the shelter, one is we just take little buckets and hang them from the front of the kennels with treats inside of them. So even if you just happen to pop in really quickly, there are treats available. You don't have to go and get some. They're right there and waiting. We also, our staff specifically that works in behavior, wears bait bags, so a super stylish fanny pack full of chopped up hot dogs so that we have them at the ready all the time. You can pick up bait bags through any pet supply store, or honestly, the gardening aprons from Lowe's and Home Depot are awesome. They work really well for, the, for this. They're very inexpensive, um, and they're easy to throw in the wash uh, to help um, you know, control concerns about a uh, spread of disease within the shelter. If we have dogs who are reactive at the front of the kennel, not because they're fearful, but because they're being demanding, because they are really excited to go for a walk. So we've already kind of got that positive conditioned emotional response. It's just maybe gone a little too far. We can start using operant conditioning with those dogs to start to establish what behaviors might get them interaction. There is a wonderful exercise called click to calm, and this is something that we do quite a bit with our dogs at the shelter. I am a big fan of marker-based training, so we use clickers at KHS. 
Uh, I definitely recommend them. I think that clickers can be a really, really helpful tool for all dog trainers and especially in shelters. But if you want to get started and you don't have a clicker, you can also use a verbal marker, which frequently is just saying the word yes um, in order to mark good behavior. And the reason that we want to use a marker, especially for this exercise, is because we need to think about the fact that when we first start seeing good behavior from these dogs at the front of a kennel, that good behavior is likely to last for like two seconds tops. So we need to find a way to communicate with our dogs that sitting or standing quietly is a good thing which is why if we click or say yes the moment that we see them sit or stand quietly, we have marked that behavior. We will then deliver a treat to them, but it is okay if their behavior has changed before they eat the treat because that marker enabled us to basically take a snapshot of the moment in time that earned them the treat that they are about to eat. So what I'll do, if I've got a really bouncy, excitable kennel, as I'll start walking up and down, and I'll pause for a few seconds in front of each kennel. If the dog is able to keep all four paws on the ground, I'm going to make that my starting criteria. And if he does that, I'm going to click and then throw him a treat. If I get to the front of the kennel and the dog jumps or barks at me, I'm going to just keep on walking and go to the next dog. And I go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as the dogs get the hang of it, I start to escalate what I'm asking for. So I might wait for the dog to sit before I click and give him a treat, or maybe even down before I click and give him a treat. Again, if we can get lots of people involved in this, we can help the dogs to do something that's called generalizing. So if only one person in the shelter walks through and does this, that one person will look like an absolute magician when they walk into the kennel because every dog will sit in front of them. If everybody does it, the dogs will sit for everybody that walks through the kennel. They won't necessarily carry it over from one person to everyone, but if you can get your whole team involved, they will start to carry it over to everyone in the shelter as well as your adopters. We do quite a bit of targeting with dogs at KHS. Targeting is teaching your dog to touch a body part to an object. You can target with your nose, you can target with your paw, you can target with your rear end, you can target with your whole body. I generally, starting off in shelters, focus mostly on nose targeting. I find it to be the most useful thing that we can do in the shelter environment. And I generally teach them to target either to my hand or to a really easy object to have around, like a wooden kitchen spoon or just a Frisbee. So this is useful. If we, say, have dogs that tend to be overly excited in the kennels, we can teach them to target their nose to a Frisbee. We can walk down the kennel. We can hold that Frisbee in front of the kennel. When they touch their nose to it, we can mark and reward. We can start to refocus them very easily in the kennel environment. It's also a great way to start teaching dogs to go out and say hello to people. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into our shy, fearful dogs. Nose targeting can even be really helpful for veterinary handling. Uh, we have dogs that go through private training with us that learn to just stick their nose to a spot, whether it's a, a Frisbee or a hand or even a spot on the wall, in order to remain still during veterinary um, handling and examination. The easiest thing that you can do is start off with hand targeting. It takes absolutely no supplies. It's super, super, super simple to introduce. Get a dog. Get some really yummy treats. Hold your hand in front of the dog's nose, about two to three inches away at first. As soon as the dog investigates your hand, mark that behavior by clicking or saying yes, and then give him a piece of treat with the other hand. And just keep this up over and over and over again until the dog starts to really um, and truly figure out that there's that his job when he sees that hand presented in front of him is to touch his nose to it. And when he can do that, you can start putting it a little bit farther away from him so that he actually has to travel to it. Um, this, again, is something that we can start to also implement with an object. If you would prefer to do this for, with a Frisbee for kennel front training, that's completely fine. I do find if you start with hand targeting on its own, 
it's a little easier than starting with targeting a Frisbee on its own. They, once they kind of build up the basics of the behavior targeting a hand, it transfers over to other objects a little bit faster than just introducing a new object right off the bat. So I spend, I've spent a lot of time in my years at KHS trying to carve out space to train. I came from, before I, I moved into shelter training, I came from uh, the private training sector. Um, so we did lessons inside people's homes. We did lessons inside a designated space. Uh, one of the biggest things that we talked about with our clients was when you first start training, find a quiet, calm space inside your home to go and train your dog. Then I moved into the shelter and I realized that there is no such thing as a quiet and calm space inside most of our shelters. It just does not exist. So something that really helped me quite a bit was instead of, you know, wandering around looking for a calm space, to start thinking about doing training in the, in the space where our dogs spend all of their time, inside the kennel itself. And you can do this either by going into the kennel with the dog or by working through the kennel. Generally speaking, what we did at KHS was we would have staff go into the kennels and we would have volunteers work on the outside of kennels, unless they were volunteers who were very experienced and had been with us quite a while. What we're doing here is changing the dynamic of the front of kennel interaction. So when we have our excitable, jumpy dogs and people walk to the front of the kennel, that almost always indicates that something exciting is about to happen to them. They might go for a walk. They might get fed. Somebody might give them a toy. Somebody might bring them out to a meet and greet room. And those exciting things are happening even if our dogs are jumping and barking and pawing and, and doing all of these rude behaviors that we might want to diminish. So instead, if we start working inside the kennels themselves on basic obedience behaviors, our dogs start to think as we walk up that it is quite possible that what's actually going to happen is I'm going to need to sit calmly and quietly in order to get attention. I mean, might need to lay down in order to get attention. And they start to show us these behaviors that we know they are capable of within the kennel environment itself. I'm going to be sending you guys um, in this resource link lots and lots and lots of videos on capturing behaviors. And this is stuff that I think is really, really, really easy to implement either at the front of the kennel or within the kennel itself. And are things that we could certainly run through how to capture all of right now, but I would like to make sure that we've got enough time to talk about shy, fearful dogs as well. But I listed out the, the behaviors that I think are most important to teach within the kennel. So sit, down, target, and place. Place, by the way, means go to your bed and calmly and quietly lay down on it. And if we can start giving our dogs to demonstrate these behaviors regularly inside the kennel, we are going to help our adopters as they walk through looking for their next pet, we're going to help them to be able to picture these dogs inside their home. Uh, studies have shown that adopters look for dogs who will engage with play and lay down during a meet and greet. And that if a dog can do those two things, they are more likely to be adopted that day. So these are things that are really important for us to help our adopters see that our dogs are, in fact, capable of doing. So shy fearfuls. These are, these are my favorites. I, I love more than anything helping these absolutely terrified dogs gain confidence realize that the world isn't terrifying. My favorite part with them is the moment where we're comfortable enough to be a bad dog. So like if I've got one in my office, that moment where all of a sudden he jumps up on the table and steals a pen from me, that's my favorite moment whatsoever with shy, fearful dogs. They're very, very near and dear to my heart. What we see most often in the shelter environment, first and foremost, is avoidant behavior. So we see dogs who might be on the very extreme thing, 
uh, end of things. Like this poor kid who's in this slide here, who has flipped his bed under over and is now hiding underneath the bed. Dogs who are completely avoiding all of the stressors that are surrounding them. We might also see dogs who aren't necessarily hiding, but are actively disengaging from contact. So we reach towards them and they lean away or turn away or even walk away from us. At KHS, we see a large number of dogs who come into us from our transport partners who have probably been farm dogs their whole life and have never seen a leash before they get to KHS. So it's very common for us to see dogs who, when we put a leash on them, pancake to the ground and just absolutely don't move at all. We see dogs who are just completely non-interactive. Or we see dogs who, when something stressful happens, take an extraordinarily long time to recover from it. Maybe a dog who came in and was relatively social and friendly and then got his intake vaccinations and has now not forgiven anyone who was in the room at that point. The most important thing that we need to understand about shy, fearful dogs is that they are using their body language and their behavior to attempt to communicate their discomfort with us. I think that this is, for those of us who truly and deeply love dogs, I think this is one of the hardest things to really wrap our brains all the way around. Because when we see that dog who is just evidently in emotional pain. You know, he's cowering at the back of the kennel. All we want to do is go make him feel better. But we, we don't always do the best job as people of recognizing is that the way we communicate as humans and the way dogs communicate as canines are not necessarily the same. And we might be taking actions that we intend to be kind that our dog may interpret as a threat simply based on how he interprets body language. So if we have a shy, fearful dog who has deliberately moved himself away from you, it's very, very important to request, uh, to respect that request that he has made for distance. He has moved himself away because he feels unsafe. And we want to honor that for him. So if I have a dog and I go up to the front of his kennel and he runs to the back of the kennel, I stay where, where I am. I do not go closer to him. I take my body language and I mirror the dog's. So if my dog has turned himself away from me and his chest is facing in the opposite direction, I'm going to turn my chest away from him and I'm going to look away from him. Instead of trying to hand a treat directly to the dog, I sort of sit turned off in the corner and I try to make the smallest movement that I can and throw treats in the general direction of the dog, trying to get them to land straight in front of him, although I have horrible aim, so I'm not always successful in that. And what I'm going to do in this case is watch the dog out of the corner of my eye. If the dog eats treats, I'm going to stay there and continue throwing treats, stay at my set distance, not move any closer to the dog. If I throw treats and the dog does not eat them, I'm going to get up and I'm going to end that interaction and I'm going to come back at a later time. Appetite is very much dictated by stress. Um, if dogs are in a state of high stress, they will not eat. If I continue sitting in front of a dog who has moved as far as he can away from me and turned his whole body away from me and I'm even if I'm throwing food at him he's not eating it. This is a dog who is trying as plainly as he knows how to say I am not comfortable with this interaction. If I respect that and in that interaction I'm going to get a dog who eventually is much more willing to attempt to interact with me in the future. If I ignore those requests and continue to move into his space, I'm basically validating to this dog that I'm scary and I can't be trusted because I don't listen to what he's trying to say. As you keep this up, and it, it's time consuming and it's painstaking, you'll start to see the dogs begin to approach you a little bit more closely. 
And as that happens, it's really important that we contain our excitement because, you know, when you have those shy, fearful dogs and they're starting to move and approach, and we've really been wanting to pet them so badly for a week at this point, once they make it all the way up to us, if we start to interact with them the way we would with our own dogs at home right off the bat, Basically, what's occurred here is the dog is taking a big risk by starting to move closer to us. We have all of a sudden become unpredictable once he has done so. He's very likely to retreat and um, move away from us right away. So what I will frequently do is just sit with treats sort of scattered all over me and just let the dog interact as he chooses. What we generally see body language-wise when they first begin to approach and interact with us is something that I call safety paws. So the dog might be sniffing you and his front paws might be close to you, but his back paws are stretched as far out behind him as he can. And that's because he's keeping that option of retreat open. I'm going to let him retreat if he chooses to, but I'm going to watch for those back paws to move up underneath the body. And when that happens, that's my indication that the dog is feeling a little bit more secure in this level of interaction. When I get to that, that is the point where I can start to offer him treats, say, directly from my hand and potentially start to actually pet and interact. As I first start interacting with shy, fearful dogs directly, I want to, again, keep the option for retreat open at all times. So the first body contact that I make is generally a tiny scratch right underneath the chin. Reaching my hand over top of the dog can be perceived as very threatening by the dog. We oftentimes see when we reach over top, ears go down, start licking their lips, maybe start to back away from us somewhat. Under the chin or on the neck or even the chest is a little bit less threatening. So I start to scratch that area and I start a five second count in my head. I'll scratch for five seconds and then I'm going to stop and move my hand away. And what I'm doing here is mimicking the, the pace of canine social introductions. If we watch dogs begin to interact with one another, when we've got socially healthy and appropriate dogs, there's a little sniff and circle, and then there's a little bit of a pause where each dog sort of checks in to say, are you still comfortable with this? I'm still comfortable with this. When I start to do that scratch and then I move my hand away and I pause, I am giving the dog the option, the choice at that point, to either continue to interact with me or to end the interaction. And allowing him that choice is absolutely crucial. If my dog begins to understand that he is not going to be forced into interactions that he cannot handle, he's going to start to solicit more interactions in the future. If he feels as though he is trapped in interactions and cannot escape from them, he is far less likely to attempt interaction in the future. We, as soon as we can get dogs to move towards us in our behavior programs, we start hand feeding them every single meal that we give them. So our rowdy, excitable, drivey dogs get enrichment feeders and our shy fearfuls get hand um, fed meals. This picture, by the way, I absolutely adore this. It's um, actually a still from a YouTube video. This gentleman in the kennel is a vet at a shelter who noticed that this little pit bull was absolutely terrified in her kennel. So every day, he put his breakfast in a dog bowl, and he put her breakfast in a dog bowl, and they sat and ate breakfast together. And I just thought it was the cutest, sweetest thing possible. So what we do at our organization, we mix together wet food and dry food. We put gloves on because that is not necessarily something that you want trapped under your nails all day long. We go into the kennel, and we start off letting the dogs control space. If they are not comfortable approaching us, they do not have to. So it may be that we go in and we throw little hand food, handfuls of this wet and dry food mixture across the room. As the dogs start to eat and start to approach on their own, we'll then start tossing the food a little bit closer, even feeding it out of our hands. We try to get as many people as possible involved in hand feeding. Because if we just have one person do it, the dog is going to start to 
um, build a really strong positive association with that particular person, but not necessarily generalize it to others. If we can get everybody involved, we can start to see some uh, broad spectrum generalization of um, positive associations with new people. This is a wonderful, wonderful um, volunteer opportunity. It's something that is so incredibly heartwarming, um, so incredibly valuable, and very, very easy for volunteers to do with a great deal of success. I told you that we were going to talk about hand targeting a little bit more with Shy Fearfuls. So as I'm starting to get to the point where um, my Shy Fearful dog is becoming more interactive, is starting to walk with people, is starting to engage a bit more, I then need to think about how I can get this dog to actually engage with strangers. And in this, I do teach hand targeting as an important skill because it allows the dog to maintain some control over the pace of an interaction. So I start off teaching them to touch their nose to my hand uh, whenever I put it out. And then once my dog can do that reliably, I start to label that behavior as go say hi. So I'll say go say hi, and I'll put my hand out in front of the dog's nose. When the dog bops his nose against my hand, I mark and deliver a treat. When he's starting to do that reliably, I then have a known person crouch down on the ground, extend their hand, and I cue my dog to go say hi, target the hand, and then return back to me in order to get a treat. And that go out, touch, and return is what is so very important in building greeting behavior with shy, fearful dogs. People as a whole are really bad about getting the puppy goggles on. So they see a dog and they absolutely want to pet that dog. And even if we say, my dog is kind of nervous, it doesn't matter because people who love dogs are all good dog people and they are all convinced that this dog will be comfortable with them. If we say, no, don't pet my dog, that does not set us up for a successful interaction because there are a lot of things that people can do around shy, fearful dogs other than pet them that can scare the dog. If we instead say, this is a very nervous dog, but he has learned to touch his nose to your hand and come back to me for a piece of treat. We are then giving our volunteers, our other staff members, our adopters, something constructive that they can do. They can stand still and hold their hand out while the dog touches his nose to their hand and returns back to me. We're giving them very clear instruction on how to have a successful interaction. And by marking that nose touch to the hand and then following up with a piece of treat, we're continuing to build strong positive associations for the dog on greeting new people. And the very last thing that I want to talk about just very briefly before we have to wrap up is helping dogs who balk on the leash because that can be um, a really challenging behavior from our shy fearfuls. We've already talked a little bit about integrating helper dogs, uh, dog social and human social dogs with our shy fearfuls. That is such a great thing. Sometimes just having a friend to walk with you can help those shy fearfuls remember that their legs work while a leash is attached to them. But something else that we want to think about as we're working on building confidence on a leash is that dogs have something that's called an oppositional reflex, which means when the leash gets tight, their brain tells them to pull back against it as opposed to walk into that pressure. That's why if we have a dog who starts to sort of balk and pull back, that behavior intensifies as the leash pressure increase, increases. So if you have a dog who is either frozen on his feet or has pancakes like this guy on the slide here, the first thing that you want to do is keep the leash slack by moving in towards him. Make sure that there's a nice little bit of a drape on the leash. Crouch down and turn to the side to make your body appear, appear small and inviting. And then we want to start finding ways to reinforce any sort of positive progress forward. If this dog has learned hand targeting, that's a great thing to do. If he hasn't, you might prompt it by making a little Hansel and Gretel trail of treats in front of him. As he starts to gain confidence, um, we can start to ask for a little bit more movement before we deliver a reward as opposed to maybe just rewarding a belly crawl at first. 
it's really important as we're working through this with these dogs to set incremental goals. If I have a dog who has never walked on a leash before, my first goal should not be a 20-minute walk with him. My first goal might be to walk from one side of his kennel to the next. And if I can do that, I can consider that a success. And the next day, we might be able to step outside of the kennel for a second and then go back into it. So as you are starting to implement stuff, you know, setting yourself up for success is important for people as well as dogs. So start small. Think about the easiest things that we've talked about today to begin to implement. And when those are going smoothly, then add a little bit more. I can't stress enough the importance of getting volunteers engaged in the process. You guys cannot do it on your own. You need help. We all work, I'm sure, absolutely crazy hours because I'm sure every single one of us is so unbelievably passionate about what we do. Let's harness those utter passionate people to give us a hand. And then as you're starting to implement things, set yourself up for success by keeping the supplies that you need around. So start putting out, please, on your Facebook page to uh, collect enrichment items and recycling items that you can use. Uh, keep treats on hand. And then above all else, reach out for help. This is my contact information. I would absolutely love to help any of you implement any of this stuff in your shelter or just workshop how your organization might be different from some others and what different solutions we might need um, in order to implement there. I think we've got some time for questions. I don't know if Meg or Deb have anything that they want to pop in with really quickly or if we want to just go ahead and go with getting some questions from anyone. Hi, Kat. Thanks so much. So I know we've covered a lot in this session, and so we'll now begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. And I'll let Kat take it away. All right, so it's looking like we haven't had any questions come through yet. Does anybody out there have anything? Okay. Uh, there's so a little I chat function that you can type them into. Yeah, in the chat, and there's also another area there, Kat, that has, um, it's called questions. And if you drop it down, you can see during the um, exercise and enrichment section, Jessica asks, what about the drain issues with the card and paper? So say you're using a Whole Foods bag with, the cutout holes. Um, she's asking about gotcha. that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, everybody's setup is a little bit different. Um, and one thing that we make sure of is that when we are in our main campus where we've got sort of circular drains, when we give those tear apart enrichment items, we just go through and pick up um, all of the debris that's left behind before we've actually tried to hose anything out in order to keep anything from getting collected into the drains. If drainage is an issue, though, there are absolutely other things that you can do. Um, and I'm happy to kind of workshop with you uh, via email, you know, ways to work around the, the drains in your particular facility. I will say, We've gotten Kongs stuck in our drains before. We have never had an issue with the paper, though. <laughs> Good. Perfect. And then there was another one from Jessica that said, do you think there's any risk of flirt poles encouraging prey drive? So that is a really, really good question. And if you put, like, five dog trainers in a room, we will have a great big rousing debate about it. Um, I would say. If we have a dog who has a history of extremely strong uh, predatory behavior that, you know, has maybe resulted in um, injury or even death towards uh, cats or small animals, that may not be an appropriate dog to flirt pole with in the shelter environment. However, there is something to be said for providing that outlet through something that is appropriate. And we talked about letting them um, catch, release uh, the uh, item that's attached to the flirt pole. Something that I'll do quite a bit of with our impulse control dogs is start to work on getting an instant drop of the item and then starting to cue sit, down, sit before releasing the flirt pole again. So what we're looking at there is it is actually an opportunity to create self-control in the face of an item that could trigger some prey drive for them. 
Does that answer it adequately? And Jessica, you can always follow up if, if you want more detail. Um, here's a few other questions. Here's one from Sandy. We have a few biters and leash biters. What do you recommend? Okay, so for leash biting behavior, one is definitely, definitely, definitely work on upping that exercise, work on upping that enrichment. That's going to be absolutely crucial. And I would think um, about finding some ways for exercise that, that is not just a walk on a leash. Leash biting behavior can be redirected through cueing into another known behavior like a hand target or a sit. But I do find that sometimes in the shelter environment, we've just got dogs who are extremely frustrated, especially in that point of the leash going on and us taking them from the kennel out to wherever our walking area is. And sometimes we just don't have those basic obedience cues proofed to the point that we can effectively use them in that setting. So there are two things that you can try. One is a lure for the dog. So for example, a glob of peanut butter either in a Kong or on a wooden kitchen spoon. As you are taking the dog from the kennel out to a play area, that um, if that is the specific time that we are seeing leash biting behavior can be very helpful. The other thing to think about, and this is the only time that I find um, a use for this particular tool, is we can do a, a um, chain bridge using a choke collar. So KHS is a 4-3 training facility. We don't use choke or proc prong or uh, shot collars in our training. But if we have a very persistent leash biter, as we are working on teaching him other more appropriate skills, we'll first fit that dog with just a regular standard flat buckle style collar. Then we take a choke chain and have it completely unstrung, so it does not go around the dog's neck at all. And we take a snap or a carabiner and clip one ring of the choke chain to the D-ring on the dog's collar. And then we take a standard leash and clip that to the other ring of the choke chain. So what this does is it gives you a bridge of chain that is right down by the dog's mouth. That's the area where they're most likely to start grabbing at the leash. But still also gives you a soft end of the leash to hold on to because the fully chain leashes can be really, really, really tough on your hands. And this is a way to start to manage that behavior in the shelter environment. Um, and prevent that practice as we're trying to get them out for their exercise sessions. There's a lot more that I could talk about with this that would take up all the rest of our time, but if you would like to email me with further questions, I can go through many, many, many more in-depth ways to work through leash biting behavior with dogs. That's great, Kat. Thank you so much. And so I've got a question from Barbara here that says, livestock guardian dogs bark instinctively. How can we reduce that without going against their protective instinct? Yeah, those perimeter guardian, guardian breeds, it's rough for them in the shelter environment. The thing is, they will still be responsive to either classical or off-rank condition. I, I would think in this particular um, case, we're more likely to see um, a need for doing some classical conditioning with them, so just walking by and treating regardless of what they're doing. The good news is the shelter is a very different environment from the home. So we are probably not going to see any significant reduction on um, that behavior in the home environment, um, especially if this is a dog who, you know, maybe somebody is adopting specifically because they're looking for a livestock guardian breed. Um, <sighs> What we are going to see is an increase in the comfort in the shelter environment. Because when we look at those dogs who have had, you know, decades or centuries of selective breeding telling them that they need to keep watch of the entire space around them, it's got to be very stressful to be in the shelter environment. So if we start thinking about that concept of changing their conditioned emotional response, by tossing a treat every time we walk past, that will reduce their stress level in the shelter environment and likely not have any sort of negative impact whatsoever on their behavior in a home. Great, Kat. Thank you so much. And so I'm just looking through. I know we've got several more questions out there. Let me look. Here's one from Jessica again on the flirt polls. What about 
what do you think about the use of flirt polls for testing possible interactions with cats? Um, I would not uh, take any behavior with that we see from flirt polls as any indication on um, whether or not the dog is able to be appropriate around cats. Um, I think we would we're going to see both false positives and false negatives. Um, cats smell different, they look different, they move differently, so I don't think that our behavior or with flirt poles would give us any useful information about whether or not we would have a cat safe dog. Okay, great. And this one is from Susan. Our rescue has gotten an increasing amount of biters from, from shelters and owner surrenders. Any ideas for where we can turn? Um, that is a tough one in that it um, is probably going to be very dependent on the individual animal um, and what the goals are for the individual animal and the specifics of each case of, um, you know, aggressive or threatening behavior. There's not really a way to give a blanket answer on that. I would say that if um, there are other rescue groups that you work with who are um, who have maybe established a history of doing some uh, behavior modification type foster um, in order to rehome, those might be good groups to work with. I would say that it's also probably a really smart idea to look for a trainer in your area who might be willing to consult with your group. And I would look for somebody who has shown a strong commitment to continued education and training, um, who holds certifications such as the CPDT in order to show said commitment to continued uh, education and training. My, my personal um, preference is leaning towards trainers who show a focus in force free training methods, especially when we're dealing with dogs that have a history of showing threatening behaviors. Um, and also potentially consulting with uh, whatever vet you work with. Because there are times where we might need to you know, question whether or not it's safe to rehome a dog. There are also times where we might be able to very effectively treat and rehome a dog um, simply by addressing the triggers for this aggression as well as reevaluating um, management and placement recommendations. But it's really hard to say yes, absolutely do this for all dogs in your care because every case is so very, very different. Right, I agree. And then this last one is from Sandy. Uh, are there CEUs for CPTD holders? We assume you know what that yes. means. Oh, um, this, is, this is not going to give you CEUs for CPTD. I'm very sorry. Um, but I can send you towards some great options in the future that will and hopefully we'll be able to be a be CEUs for you in the future. Exactly. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Kat, go ahead. I was going to say that is continuing the education units for um, the CPDT dog trainer certification. So. Okay, perfect. Well, look, we'll wrap it up today, and I've got all your questions here, and I'll send these, I'll send these over to Kat. Um, but I do want to say this was a super helpful session, and I want to extend a, a thank you to Kat Rooks from the Kentucky Humane Society for her thought leadership and for everyone else attending today's webinar. So you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view uh, the recording from today, and then also Kat's resource page that she mentioned. Um, and then you can also still see her screen where she's got Kat Rooks and then where she can be reached. Um, yeah, with any other questions. Um, and if there's anything else that you ever need from the Pedigree Foundation, please reach out to us. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.